So thanks very much, Nima, for that very kind introduction. <clears throat> so before I begin, I want to get to know my audience a little bit. Who is a postdoc or older? Okay. Who is a grad student who is in the best time of their life? You know, you're about to, you already have a job going into the next semester. Okay, a few of you. Okay. So who is a, and who's going to apply this year? Yeah, it's a good distribution. Okay. And then uh, younger, I guess everyone else. Just put up your hands so I get an idea. Okay, so most of you are actually younger. Okay, good. Okay, so very good. Um, so the topics I'm going to cover are new searches for dark matter and dark sectors, and I'll explain a little bit more what that is. But the topics for the three lectures are, I'll begin with an introduction, you know, why subgv dark sectors. Then we'll talk about accelerate-based searches for dark photons. I'll introduce a very simple dark sector, uh, which is a very good, sim uh, sort of a nice toy model. <clears throat> and then we'll also consider dark matter that's light and can be produced at accelerator, accelerators, colliders, beam dump experiments, and things like that. And then I'll talk about direct detection of subgv dark matter. There's a lot of work in this direction over the last few years. And then I'll end with sort of a, the next decade. Where could we hope, what could we hope to learn in the next decade? What kind of experiments might come online over the next decade? And what kind of models are these experiments probing, uh, going after? So um, a dark sector is, I'll define it a bit later in more, more precisely, but a dark sector is basically a collection of particles that is neutral under the standard model forces. So it doesn't interact with any of the standard model forces. Instead, it interacts with some new forces. And to make it interesting, we often imagine that these, the sector does have some interaction with the standard model sector. So it's not completely decoupled. That, that is, of course, some, that, that is a possibility. But it is something we, to make it more exciting, you know, there's many reasons to think that it might actually be coupled to us. And then the question is, how do we look for that? And where should we look for that? So um, when I was preparing these lectures, <clears throat> you know, I was thinking back to when I was a student nine years ago. Um, I was in this great uh, time where I already had a job. I was going to go to Slack in 2008, um, and it was the summer before. And you know, thinking back, it was a really exciting time. The you know, LHC was about to turn on with all its promise in, in, you know, in 2000, um, a few years later after that. But it was you know, on the rise, and people were preparing for it. It was very exciting. People were reporting very interesting results from indirect detection experiments. The Pamela satellite saw an excess of cosmic ray positrons at energies above 10 GeV. And that was super exciting because it might be a signal of dark matter, dark matter annihilating to you know, charged particles that give you this excess of cosmic rays. Um, and the cool thing was that it was not some standard thing. It wasn't like a normal wind, but it couldn't be a normal wind. It had to be something more interesting. The Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope was about to, you know, was, was just launched. And uh, in June 2008, actually. And that was going to you know, revolutionize, potentially, our search for dark matter, looking for indirect detection signals. In addition, there were tons of direct detection experiments that were taking data. Some of them had reported anomalies for a long, long time. So I'm sure all of you have heard about DAMA. Who has not heard about DAMA? OK, so DAMA sees an animal modulation, signal, animal modulation of the signal in the detector. And they've reported evidence for dark matter since 1997. And you know, at that time, things were sort of really coming together. There was a lot of data coming. It was a really exciting time. And I bring this up for two reasons. So I think now things are a bit different. I don't think that the next decade is going to have as much data coming as um, you know, that, that, is, that we think is going to revolutionize things, or that we're sure are going to revolutionize things as we were maybe nine years ago. I think you know, the, the LSE turning on, that was super exciting. And you know, there still, of course, might be great surprises coming from the LHC. You know, the LHC has only collected a tiny fraction of its data. But I think the next decade, there's a question about where things, you know, where are we going to see the new breakthrough? And it's not clear as it was perhaps as we thought it was you know, nine years ago when I was starting my postdoc. Uh, the dark matter anomalies that were exciting at the time, they've largely disappeared, I think. You know, they, they, most people don't take them seriously anymore as, as evidence for dark matter. And you know, there's a question about where else should we be looking. The second reason that I, wanna, that I bring this up is you know, around that time, the idea of dark sectors really started emerging, especially below the GV scale. Now, the idea of dark sectors was around well before that. People talked about you know, mirror dark matter, uh, hidden, hidden valleys before that, you know, Strassler and Zurich and Böhm 
talked about MEV scale dark matter several years before that and for as well. Um, <coughs> but you know, in 2008, with these anomalies, it was really exciting because it really sort of gave us an idea uh, that there might be this new GV scale sector that we could look for. And that was started with work by you know, Nima, uh, Neil, Doug, and Tracy, and then also Maxime Pospolov, Adam Ritz, and, and Mikhail Voloshin. And it was a really exciting time because we just realized that there could be the stuff sitting at the GV scale and below, and we didn't even, wouldn't even know about it. And we needed new experiments to find out what it is and, and if it's there. So I think you know, since then, there's been a lot of development in, in the field, a lot of searches for these sub-GV sectors. Uh, there's a lot more searches that can be done and that people are planning at uh, future colliders, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, and um, I think also you know, things have progressed. So, not, so one, one other topic that's sort of emerging over the last few years is the idea of sub-GV dark matter. So not just that there's some mediators at the light scale, but also that dark matter itself could be below the GV scale. And that, that is actually a very good place to look for dark matter. No guarantees of finding anything, but it is a good place to look for it. And the question is, you know, well, one, one thing you might ask is, am I co as confident now as I was perhaps in 2008 that we're going to find new physics beyond the standard model in the next few years? And I don't think I am right now, but I'm still very excited because the searches that are being proposed, the experiments that are being done, they are really probing new parameter space, and stuff could just be, you know, there could be an amazing explosion of, um, of you know, new particles and, and, and new, uh, new advances of finding new physics. So I'm still very excited. I'm super excited about all these searches. And it's really a topic that has been, you know, as I said, growing over the last few years and building up. Um, and there's been a lot of theory work, and now it has to be followed up with real experiments. So new experiments to look for this. So I'll tell you about stuff that uh, is coming up uh, the next few years and you know, the next few lectures. And to for review, so we just put out, uh, the community put out a report, a white paper on what kind of new searches could be done looking for light dark matter beyond WIMP dark matter. And that review is called the Cosmic Visions Workshop. It's a white paper and you can look at it here. And the other reviews, so there was a workshop last year where there was also a summary afterwards, which was the Dark Sectors Workshop, so that's 1608-08-632, and an older one, 1311.0029. This was written for Snowmass effort, and as you can see, there's a lot of white, I'm giving reference for white papers. The hope is that you know, the funding agencies will take these white papers and actually turn them into real funding for these experiments and, and um, you know, that, that there's real advances. But there's a lot of ideas from the community um, that are being summarized. So this paper also contains topics actually that Peter Graham will cover, so ultralight dark matter. Um, and I'll focus on, on only part of that, on, on only part of that, uh, what's in that report. So the existence of dark matter is perhaps, you know, I think the best motivation to consider a dark sector. So 25% of the dark, of the energy density in the universe is roughly dark matter, 5% is visible and 70% is some dark energy. And the fact that there is dark matter that you know, we haven't seen interact with ordinary matter, <clears throat> at, least at, at least with the large interactions, that suggested that you know, maybe it is in a dark sector. Maybe it has some tiny interactions, but we need to explain why these tiny interactions are not there. A simple explanation is that the dark matter is just not charged directly under the standard model forces. So I think the existence of a dark sector is something that is motivated by the existence of dark matter. And then we can ask all kinds of questions about how it might interact. Okay, so. So what I wanna to do to begin is I wanna quickly give a brief review of the dark matter landscape. And last week you heard a little bit about sort of a big picture overview, but I think it's good to just begin again with that. 
So if we have a mass axis and we ask, where could dark matter lie? So there's a scale 10 to the minus 22 EV, roughly. That is the lower bound on dark matter. If you ask what the de Broglie wavelength is of dark matter with a mass, with that mass, and you ask, would it fit into a dwarf galaxy? That's the lower bound of the mass that it could have. So if you make the mass lighter, the de Broglie wavelength of dark matter and dwarf galaxies will be larger, and you couldn't form structure on that scale. So basically, bosonic dark matter, we wanted to be, or any dark matter, we wanted to be above the scale. Um, there's a bound for fermions, which is about a few hundred EV or 100 EV in that scale. You can ask the same question, take a dwarf galaxy and you want to put in a fermion now in the dwarf galaxy and you want to pack them all in because of the Pauli exclusion principle, there's only so much you can pack in. And it turns out that you have at the, around 100 EV, 1 kV or so, that's the lower bound on fermionic dark matter. So everything below of that 100 EV, kV or so, below that is bosonic. That dark matter could be an axion, particularly the QCD axion. It could be a pseudoscalar. It could be a vector boson. Um, and that's the stuff that Peter's going to talk about in much more detail about how to look for that. Okay. Then we can ask, um, there's another scale, roughly KEV up to 100 TeV. So in this scale, would be thermal dark matter. <clears throat> so if you have dark matter that is in thermal contact with the standard model in the early universe, so at the very early in the very early universe, the universe was hot, the dark matter is perhaps annihilating the standard model particles and vice versa. That's how freeze out works. If you put the if you ask what is the mass, what's the lowest possible mass of dark matter? It turns out that it's about a kV. So the reason is that as you make the mass lighter, it takes longer for that particle to become non-relativistic. And structure forms differently. Do, um, you know, I mean, structure, in order to form structure, in order to make clumped dark matter, the particle, of course, needs to be non-relativistic. So it takes longer to, to make the dark matter, for the dark matter to become non-relativistic. And it turns out that if you want to form dwarf galaxies again, so again, this is the third time we hear about dwarf galaxies. So this is what the bound would need to be, um, kV. Now, if it is really is in thermal contact, then, uh, so for example, if a couple of the electromagnetic charge, so a couple of scatters of electrons or positrons or photons, um, then it can also mess up BBN, in particular, or the ineffective measurement, the, the number of relativistic degrees of freedom of, um, in, the, in the universe. So we know that's roughly three from neutrinos. And if you've got dark matter that's interacting with electromagnetic charged particles and it's in thermal equilibrium at the time that neutrinos decouple, you affect the temperature of the photon bath and you heat it up and you mess up um, how that relationship occurs in the standard model where it would be three and it would be different. And that roughly puts a bound of an MeV. So what I'm gonna do we can make this part a little bit dotted. So you might imagine that there's some exceptions to this. But in principle, uh, below an MAV, you have to worry about bounds from ineffective and BBN. So if you really want to have a thermal contact, then it should probably be above an MAV. The upper bound 100 TV comes from unitarity. So if you make the dark matter too heavy, the cross section will be too small from unitarity considerations, and you just can't. Uh, deplete enough of the dark matter in order to satisfy the relic abundance, and then you get, um, yeah, you produce too, too much dark matter if it's in thermal contact and if it's, it has a mass above 100 TV, and uh, so that's a rough upper bound. Again, there's exceptions, but this is a rough, you know, good, good picture. Okay. You can, of course, go higher. So once you go above the Planck scale, you have things you, you can consider composite dark matter. If you go much, much higher, uh, like 30 solar masses or so, 
then you might imagine that you've got primordial black holes, which could explain the LIGO signal. That's very exciting. There's a lot of work on that. Uh, but we're not going to consider that here today or in these lectures. <clears throat> so, good. Now, the traditional WIMP sits around here. Few GV to, you know, TV or tens of TV, depending on what you want to consider a WIMP. And what we're going to focus on is below that scale. What I wrote doesn't make sense. So few GV to TV. And what we're going to do is consider things below the scale, so below the GV scale. And so I'll talk about things roughly down to milli EV but most of my focus will be mega EV up to GEV. Okay. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so last week you heard about a tons of particular, you know, tons of different models that could sit here, tons of different dark matter candidates across all this whole space. Um, sterile neutrinos, you know, are a great candidate. I'm sure it was discussed, you know, sitting around the KV scale. That's a very interesting dark matter candidate. Um, you'll hear about the lighter stuff, as I said, from other people, but let's talk about WIMS for a second, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Okay. So, Despite the fact that I'm talking about searches for dark matter beyond WIMPs, so not WIMPs, I want to just you know, make sure there's no confusion. I do think that WIMPs are great candidates and that people should be looking for them. I just think that the experimental program for them is well established. It needs to be completed. There's huge experiments, the so-called G2 generation 2 experiments, Super CDMS and LZ that are going after that. Those are very important experiments. The LHC has done amazing work you know, looking for WIMPs. Possibly uh, that could be produced at colliders. There'll be much more of that coming. Um, and Fermi you know, has, for example, Fermi and, and others, other satellite experiments as well, uh, look for indirect detection signals. So I think that's all great stuff. And WIMPs are great. And WIMPs are great for a reason, mainly for two things, because of the WIMP, so-called WIMP miracle, which is the statement that a particle that has interactions with the standard model weak force, which um, and the mass of order of the weak scale, 100, 100 GV roughly, can give you automatically the right relic abundance if it's in thermal equilibrium with a standard model in the early universe, just from thermal freeze out. So I think that's a super exciting you know, observation. Whether it's anything to do with nature, whether it's how dark matter is produced, we don't know. But I think that is certainly a, an interesting uh, observation. And of course, the second reason is that we think that there should be new physics near the weak scale anyway because of the hierarchy problem. So the fact that a particle at that scale that might have, that, that if, if such a particle is stable and if it has interaction with the weak force could be the dark matter candidate is very suggestive that you know, these things might have the same solution. Now, WIMPs, um, so I think this, this does motivate WIMPs. And there's a ton of searches for WIMPs. And very quickly, because Neil did this, but you know, you've got the dark matter, not your standard model particles. The, depending on how you rotate this diagram, there's the various searches that you get. Annihilation, dark matter annihilation with indirect detection going from left to right. You can have scattering, dark matter scattering of nuclei, for example, or of new things, as, as I'll talk about in the third lecture, um, which can give you direct detection signals and underground detectors. And of course, going from right to left, you can produce this at the collider. And as I said, there's a big, uh, the, there's an important program going on for that. Um, so even though they're important, I think it's good to think beyond the WIMP. And there's several reasons to do that. We 
we have not seen them. <clears throat> we have not seen con any convincing evidence for WIMPs. I think um, we had ample opportunity to do that. So Fermi has done, as an example, Fermi has done an amazing job, um, and it's disfavored dark matter particles that are that typically of WIMPs would annihilate to standard model particles, and has disfavored them up to 100 GV or so in various channels, and. And as a legal disclaimer, I'm going to put yet. Uh, the other reason is that the LHC has, no, has not seen any new physics yet. So anything that might solve the hierarchy problem and with it come along, and with it that you, you might get a dark matter candidate coming along with it, that has not uh, materialized either. And again, legal disclaimer. And <clears throat> the other thing is that you know, WIMPs are produced in the early universe from thermal freeze-out. But there's a whole variety of different production mechanisms that exist for dark matter. So dark matter could produce from some initial asymmetry. Um, you know, baryons, the reason there's a baryon abundance, the, the reason we have baryons, more baryons than antibaryons, is because of some initial asymmetry. We don't yet know how that arose in the early universe, but there's no reason why the dark matter shouldn't arise from some similar initial asymmetry. And given that, it is reasonable you know, to, yeah, that, that's a totally fine production mechanism. In fact, nature has chosen that already, uh, initial asymmetry has chosen that production mechanism for uh, the standard model particles, baryons. <clears throat> so several known, or several possible, I should say, and last week, I think you heard about Friesen, Simps, Elders, Wimpless, etc. So freeze out, thermal freeze out is not the only possibility. And then one thing that I think is very interesting, and maybe not get enough attention from particle physicists yet, is the so-called small-scale crisis of lambda CDM. So if you take n-body simulations of dark matter and you see how structure forms, it works really well on larger scales, larger than galactic scales, roughly. Uh, you know, tens of 10 kiloparsecs, larger than tens of kiloparsecs. But once you get to smaller scales, things become a bit more discrepant between the observations and the n-body simulations. And that might be because, you know, Including baryons is a complicated thing, especially from first principles. So you have to make some assumptions when you include baryonic effects, and that might be a totally fine explanation. So it might just be a wimp, cold, collisionist dark matter particle that, ex that you know, works once you include the baryonic effects could explain all this. Um, but it might also be indicative of a new, of non-trivial dark matter dynamics. So it might be indicative of self interaction in the dark sector. So if dark matter self interactions, then it could explain some of these. And in the discussion session, maybe we can talk more about this, but there's a core versus cusp problem. Missing satellites. Too big to fail. And then um, <clears throat> a recent one is called the diversity of rotation curves. Okay. Who's heard of that last one? A few of you? Who's not heard of it? More. Okay, so very, very briefly, uh, we can also do this more in the discussion session. Uh, if you look at the, so if you look at galactic rotation curves, right, you can measure the stars, the speed of the stars going around the center in spiral galaxies, for example, and you can just infer from that how much mass there has to be within that radius. And 
Let's take galaxies that have a common mass scale, um, like a total mass, so same, similar mass galaxies. So one measure of how much mass, how massive they are is by looking at the velocity of the stars at large radii. So some circular velocity. And if we take galaxies of similar size, then roughly what we expect is that they look like this. And this you would get from, you know, assuming um, you call dark matter simulation. That's what you get from dark matter simulations, even when you include some baryonic effects, depending on how you do them. And instead, what you see is a whole different range, a diverse range of possibilities for how the stars behave as a function of radius. So if you look at different galaxies, sometimes you see data that looks like this. Sometimes it goes like this. Sometimes it, of course, agrees. But there's a whole different range, even though at high radii, it all seems to be the same. Um, and the prediction from just lambda CDM would be the solid line. So if you want to know more about this, this is actually was pretty recently pointed out. There's a very nice review on SIDM, self indacting dark matter, to explain some of these issues by Tulin and you. Uh, I'll even give you the, well, I actually don't have it, so 2017, so it's pretty recent. But it so summarizes all these various issues and how self indacting dark matter may or may not explain some of these things. Can MON be used to explain the risk? So, um, <coughs> I think there have been claims to that effect, but I don't know. So, I, I'm not expert enough to answer this properly. Yeah, so I don't know. But, okay, let's see. I wonder if there's a better way of doing this. Anyway, okay. Okay, so as I said, our focus will be GV down, down to milli EV, but uh, mostly down to mega EV, so big M EV. And um, here in that range, we have, generically, we, we don't call these WIMPs, so we have our mass axis again. We have uh, the GV scale here, so WIMPs, are sitting above here. And our focus will be below this. And generically, so here that's our main focus. Um, but we will go down also to you know, milli EV. <coughs> and Peter will take over below that. So, in general, there's different ways of defining things, of course, but we, we can call this hidden sector dark matter or dark sector dark matter. And below this, we can call this, so it continues, we can call this ultralight dark matter. So here it has to be bosonic, ultralight is bosonic. Um, and hidden sector dark matter can, of course, extend much, much higher. Um, but in, so below the GV scale, we don't call them WIMPs, okay? At least not in these lecture series. Now, you can ask the question, why, is the, why can't you have a WIMP below the GV scale? And let's quickly review that.
So there's something called the Lee Weinberg bound for WIMPs. And reviewing this will also be useful to show how we can have light dark matter. So if we take a just a prototypical WIMP, so something that interacts with Z boson, <coughs> we know this is you know, yeah, basically ruled out for various reasons. But let's just imagine we have that. Um, I'm going to give you another reason why it's ruled out for very light dark matter. So consider the dark matter mass less than the weak scale. So we're getting, we want to go to the light scale. So less than the mass of the W or the Z boson. And such dark matter can annihilate to standard model particles through the Z. And we can write down the cross section. So there's some, right, some Lagrangian. We have got some, the G Fermi, the, the Fermi scale. So one of a MW squared, one of MZ squared, roughly with the right coupling constants. And we've got chi, some gamma matrix, chi bar, and F bar, gamma F. And the cross section, non cross section, is going to scale as G Fermi squared times the mass of the dark matter over pi. And this goes as a picobon times m chi over 5 GeV, roughly. S yeah, good. Oh, wait, squared. OK. Now, why picobon? Why did I normalize it to that? Because that's the WIMP miracle, right? So WIMP. Uh, the typical weak interaction cross-section is a picobon, and that gives me the right relic abundance. So roughly, a picobon is, is what I need to get the right relic abundance. And that's the scaling as a function of mass. And what you can see is that as I lower the mass of the dark matter below 5 GV, the cross-section decreases. And the abundance, the dark matter abundance, is going to go as 1 over the cross-section. So the abundance increases. So as the lower the dark matter mass, the cross-section is too small in order for the dark matter to be depleted away, to be annihilated away, and I'm going to have too much dark matter. Okay, and that's the bound. So we need the WIMP to be above a few GeV. Now, it's easy to evade this bound, but we can't do it in the standard model. We can't do it with standard model forces. One way to evade the bound is that we can introduce light mediators. Okay, so let's do that. <clears throat> and the way to do that, well, one simple way of doing that is that we just consider some effective Z prime model. evade bound by introducing a light mediator. So the same annihilation as above, I'm just going to call it a different thing, like a Z prime, and it's going to have some coupling, which here, some arbitrary couplings, G chi. Here's some arbitrary couplings GF to my standard model fermions. <clears throat> and this cross section will, and I'm going to consider a light Z prime mass. And this cross section will then scale differently. So now you don't integrate out the Z and then get the G Fermi up, like up there. Now you got a, uh, now it's going to be uh, a bit different. So you got a G chi squared. GF squared, so just each of these couplings squared in the cross section, is going to be a mass of the dark matter squared above, and then MA prime, sorry, MZ prime to the fourth in the bottom. And again, we can normalize it to a picobon and put some numbers to this. So G chi, let's imagine it's 0.5 squared. G for GF, 
imagine 0 0.01, 0, 0, 001 squared. <clears throat> There's a m chi squared. So let's pick it 100 MeV. And then times by a GeV, for example, for the mediator. Okay, so if you put in these numbers, you get roughly a picobond. And this is totally fine, okay? So there's no problem with having a 100 MeV dark matter particle, for example. And what we've done is just lowered the Z boson, the, the, the uh, mediator mass. So that's fine. Um, and I think this is interesting. So, you know, for even pretty small couplings, these couplings are not huge, right? They're 10 to minus 3, for example, this one. This is pretty big, but you know, not that big either. Um, you can get the right relic abundance um, as long as you're willing to have light mediators. And of course, light mediators, that's what you have in a dark sector. Okay. So if you want to look for light dark matter, we're typically talking about dark sectors. Now, just to turn this argument around a little bit, here we get the right relic abundance from thermal freeze-out. What we have are couplings, they're not that small, right? And we could imagine that this is something that a collider or a beam dump, you know, you know an electron positron collider or a beam dump experiment could see, or even a direct detection experiments could see if you had the sensitivity to see light dark matter. And if we ask about what kind of models there could be, you know, what, what models are we not searching for with current techniques with the WIMP searches? And which models should we be searching for? The sub-GV scale is a very interesting area because you can have, you can get the right relic abundance from thermal freeze out and other ways. You can get the right relic abundance from the things that were mentioned last week, like the SIMP and ALDER and Friesen. In each of those cases, there is some connection to the standard model between the dark matter and the standard model. And you're in some thermal contact in these various mechanisms. And because you're in some thermal contact, that means that the couplings can't be that small because otherwise you wouldn't be in thermal contact. So the coupling between the dark matter and the, and, the, and the standard model particles. And since the couplings are not that small, you can hope to look for these in accelerators and, and direct detection experiments as long as you have the sensitivity, right? And as long as you're doing the right types of experiments and right types of searches. And that's what I'll be talking about. What kind of searches could be done to, to look for this but sort of a general point, the most, um, you know, many discoverable models, things that we could find, that we could discover, are in thermal contact, and the couplings are not that small. They're actually pretty sizable. So it's important to sort of look for, for these things, I think. And since the, you know, GV scale and up has been covered very well, we should be going to lighter masses to see if dark matter could be hiding there. Of course, dark matter could be, you know, might have tiny interactions or no interactions with the standard model particles, and then we're just out of luck. But if we ask where else should we be looking, this sub-GV scale is a very, very good area to look because you can have models with pretty sizable couplings if there's some kind of thermal contact, which makes things very predictive. And in the last lecture, when I'll talk about, uh, so the next decade, models and predictions, I'll talk a little about some of these models that you've already heard about, but I'll just put them you know, on a plot and see what the target is. Where in, in the interaction strength do they need to lie to get the right relic abundance? And what projections are there from prospective colliders and, and um, direct detection experiments to look for them? Okay. And then just to make the point again, I sort of said it already, but you know, so we said the sub-GV scale is a good place to look because above a GV, there's a lot of experiments going on already. Sub-GV, uh, if you want to be in thermal contact, the couplings can't be that small. So it seems like a very discoverable area. So you should probe it and see if there's anything lying there. But if you go too light, 
right below an MEV, and you want to have thermal contact, then of course there's a bounds again from BBN. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't models there that you should be looking for, there absolutely are, but uh, there it's more of a, it's, it's not, there's not a clear target as such, but for some of these models with thermal contact, uh, going down to an MEV scale from GV to MEV is, is a very useful thing, very good thing to do. Okay, so let's now talk about dark sectors and set up a simple model. <clears throat> so again, the dark sector is a collection of particles that are neutral on the standard model forces, and it's interacting with some new force. So what we have is some standard model sector and some dark sector. The word dark sector, hidden sector, hidden valley, they all mean the same thing. Um, dark matter could be part of this dark sector. The standard model has the matter and the forces, right, all of this here. The dark sector could be super simple or it could be arbitrarily complicated, we have no idea, okay? Um, and of course, to make progress, to start something, you consider simple things and you build on that and uh, you keep building on that. <clears throat> if that is all that, that exists, that's not the most exciting thing that's possible, but if we wanna ask what kind of models should we be looking for, what kind of dark sector should we be looking for, then we need to be able to produce it in, uh, in the lab or look for it in some other way. And uh, so then typically people talk about portals. So there's some portal between the dark sector and the standard model sector, some connection. Now again, the possibilities for the different portals are immense in principle, okay? So you can write down all kinds of higher dimensional operators, you can write down you know, all kinds of possible connections. But we can simplify things a little bit to ask and ask the question, if we had a dark sector, which portals are the most important? Which one should we be looking for first, okay? And then the answer actually becomes uh, much, the, the, you can focus in on a much more narrow subset. Okay. So which portals are most important? <clears throat> so, which portal is most important? That depends on the mediator that does this connection between the standard model and the dark sector. So we can have various types of mediators. We can have a scalar. We can have a vector boson. We can have a, um, a pseudoscalar. Um, we can have fermions connecting. And each of these particles, so it depends on the spin and the parity of the mediator, and uh, you can ask in each case, what is the lowest dimensional operator that we can write down? And this is actually dictated by the standard model symmetries. So you can't, it's not arbitrary. The standard model symmetries dictate which portals you can write down. So for example, <clears throat> if we have a scalar, then we can write down interaction mu phi plus lambda phi squared times h dagger h, where h is the Higgs, of course, and phi is some new scalar, some singlet under the standard model. And this gives us the Higgs portal. And the dimension of that portal is just four. If we have a fermion, so here's the scale of phi, fermion, some n, then I can write down another operator that connects it to the fermion. So there's some coupling, y sub n, there's my n, and I can connect it to LH, where L is the lepton SC2 doublet, SC2 lepton doublet in the standard model. And this is called the neutrino portal. And also it has dimension four. 
Then I can write down, take a vector boson. <coughs> I call it a prime u. Uh, I can write down into action epsilon over two cosine theta w, and I'm being careful with the normalization, as you'll see a bit later. And there's some interaction between the hypercharge and the hidden U1. So what I have is a U1 gauge boson, and that can mix with the hypercharge, and there's some mixing parameter <coughs> epsilon. Okay? And theta w is the Weinberg mixing angle, just theta weak. So that, uh, we'll talk more about this. So this will be our main focus, the vector. I'll say very briefly a few words about this. And of course, the other portal I'm going to leave to Peter. So that's the axiom portal. So that axiom portal is uh, dimension five. But let me just write down, let me just finish writing this down. So that's the vector portal. And also it's dimension four. And then finally, just to, if I've got some pseudoscalar, it doesn't have to be the QCD axion. It could be some other, some other pseudoscalar. Uh, pseudoscalar A. Then I can write down an interaction, which is A over F sub A, F sub A so some scale, some high mass scale, and f mu, f mu tilde. And this is uh, dimension five, so it's not renormalizable, but um, for a pseudoscalar, that's the most important portal. And so the, the fermion portal, um, let me just write down, oh well, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so the, We'll focus on the vector portal, the kinetic mixing portal. For pseudoscalar portal, you can see the lectures by you know, Michael Dine talked about this as well last week, and, and, and Peter Graham will talk about it this week. Various searches for that. Then the neutrino portal, you had Andre talk about this. Uh, neutrinos, I assume, you, I'm not quite sure all the things he covered, but that, that, that would be something that he may have covered. And uh, for scalar portal, I'm just going to mention very briefly some references. Yeah. So why are higher dimensions, are they not important? Higher dimensional operators, is there a sense that they wouldn't be the way dark matter talks to us? So I think uh, higher dimensional operators are, you know, we don't know how dark matter talks to us, to us so that, that's a totally fine thing to consider. The way I'm arguing for it here is that we want to ask what's the most important portal, and that's typically the one with the lowest dimension, you know, renormalizable. Um, well, in the case of the scalar, there's even a super normalizable uh, uh, piece to it, phi h dagger h. But um, that, so I'm just arguing from that point of view. Uh, it's more like motivating these, you know, the next set of searches that we'll talk about. But you're right, you know, we, again, we have no idea how, what dark matter does to us. But if you want to organize your thinking about what should we be looking for, this is certainly a good thing to look for because it has the lowest dimension. It's not suppressed by a high mass scale, okay, with the exception of the, the pseudoscalar. But, um, you know, so, so the vector, there's no mass scale suppression. We'll talk about that in a few, few minutes, a bit more. Um, and uh, so those are the most important possible connections to a, to a dark sector. Okay, so for the scalar, let me just make some comments still. So if you ask, if you just take that, what I've written there, the mu phi plus, plus lambda phi squared h dagger h, and you ask what is the connection what is the connection of a phi to standard model fermions? So that comes, of course, from the Higgs mixing. And what you get from that operator is an interaction between the phi and standard model fermions with a coefficient of mu times mf over mh squared. So the f's are the standard model fermions. Okay. 
And what you see is that that interaction, because you're coupling through the Higgs, you're mixing with the Higgs, and because the Higgs mixes, the Higgs couples to fermions proportional to the mass of the fermion, you see that the scalar basically, the way it couples to a particular fermion is through the mass. So low mass, so, like, so coupling to the first generation is very small, and coupling to the third generation quarks is you know, more important as a larger coupling. So this portal is most constrained by third generation meson decay searches. Um, but it's a perfectly fine portal to consider, and many people have. And uh, if you want to see more discussion about this, you can look at this paper here and references therein. So this paper doesn't do a good job actually either, but it gives references, which should do a better job. Okay. Good. Now, okay, so going a little bit further than what, what Harry's question was, you know, why not other things? So you can consider other things. So you can also consider things where you might couple to the baryon current. So some global symmetry of the standard model, even if it's anomalous, you can consider that. And those are fine, <coughs> those are fine things to consider. Uh, they require more model building. You know, if you have, if you couple to some anomalous symmetry, some anomalous global symmetry and you gauge it, so you, you have to introduce some other fermions at the weak scale or at some high, a little bit, uh, scale a little bit above that to cancel the anomalies. But you can do that. That's just a model building thing. There's, you know, pos there's more constraints on that uh, in principle that you have to worry about. But as a low energy effective theory, that's a fine thing to consider. So you shouldn't just think that that's the only thing. The vector portal that I'll talk about here is very special. As we'll see, it couples to both leptons and quarks. You can also consider things that just couple to quarks or that just couple to leptons. They're slightly, maybe ugly a little bit, but they're fine things to consider. And from logically, we want to have searches for new experiments that we think about. We want to be able to probe both lepton couplings and also coupling to quarks. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so let's then focus on the vector portal and just do some very basic, quickly talk about the basics of that portal and basically of kinetic mixing. And then what we'll see is how we can produce the particles and how, what kind of searches we should be doing. So kinetic mixing basics. So given how much attention this thing gets, uh, you should know about it if you don't. Um, who's, who's done, who, who knows what a dark photon is and things like that? Most of you. Who does not know? Don't be shy. A few of you. Okay. So most of you, it's review, but not everyone. So let's just quickly do that. So what we're going to consider is a dark sector, which is super simple, just a U1, an abelian gauge group, and it's a Higgs U1. So we're going to consider there's some that, that the gauge bows are mediating the interaction is massive. Okay, we don't really care about exactly how or what scale it's gauge at what scale it's um, broken the gauge symmetry. But um, at the end, if I've got some time, I might make some comments about that. But we're going to consider just the, the mediator. So there's a U1 prime Higgs. The mediator is going to be called A prime because I'm giving the lectures. If Maxime Possible were giving the lectures, it would be called V. Uh, and the kinetic mixing parameter is going to be called epsilon. If Maxime Possible or others were giving it, it would be kappa. And there's other notations like U boson and, and um, A sub D and chi for the for the mixing, et cetera. So that all means the same thing, but we'll call it A prime and epsilon. And what we're interested in is the low mass part of it, right? So this 
Kinetti mixing portal interacts with the hypercharge, so it's a, it's a hidden U1 interacting with the hypercharge, but we are interested in, in it at low energies, and in that case, it actually is just interacting with the electromagnetic um, U1, so the U1 electromagnetic, the electromagnetic current. So at low energies, So what that means is below electric semi breaking, what we have is a Lagrangian, which is, so F and F and is kinetic terms for the, hyper for the electromagnetic current. Then we've got the hidden U1. We've got a mixing parameter. Because I'm already coupling to the to the electromagnetic current, there's no cosine theta w there anymore. Okay, so that's been absorbed, but it's the same epsilon as defined before. And then I've got an interaction with the of the photon to the electromagnetic current, of course, and of the dark photon to any hidden sector stuff. So any hidden sector particles that are charged under the U1 prime, under the hidden U1. And <clears throat> so this, so the, the J dark here would be, well, I need to write down the electromagnetic current, but the J dark is, chi bar gamma mu chi, plus other things, okay? So where chi could be the dark matter, okay? Now, in order to remove this kinetic mixing term, we can do a field redefinition. And what we can do is we can take, so remove mixing term. And by doing this re field redefinition, we wanna make sure that we don't get into uh, generating a mass for the photon. Sorry, I forgot one important term. So there's a mass for the photon here for the dark photon. So when we do this field definition, we don't want to introduce a mass for the photon. So one way to do that is that we take the dark photon field just to itself and the photon field to the photon field plus a small mixing with the dark photon. And in that case, you know, this mass term this A prime doesn't change, so there's no, you know, you're not mixing the photon into it, so there's no mass of the photon coming. So you're still gonna be in the mass eigenstate basis. And, but what this term does here is that basically gets rid of the kinetic mixing term, and it introduces a coupling of the dark photon to uh, the electromagnetic current. <clears throat> so doing this gives that the main effect that we care about is that this term here, the coupling of the photon to the dark, to the electromagnetic current, changes and now becomes, now gets an additional piece, which is epsilon times E times the dark photon to the electromagnetic current. Okay. So what this means is that all standard model electrically charged particles have a dark millicharge. Okay, so a millicharge under the dark U1. So we can do this diagrammatically. So in diagrams, We've got F, F, F bar. We have the photon. Some kinetic mixing here. And here's the dark photon. 
So if you just consider this as a diagram, what we have here is a propagator, one by Q squared. This epsilon gets multiplied by Q squared here from the mixing. So this is in the original basis. And that's the same thing as just having a different basis where we consider the dark photon with the coupling to F bar, F, so any standard model particle with the coupling of epsilon times E. <clears throat> okay, so the dark photon covers anything that has an electric charge. So that's the quarks and the charged leptons. And just to be a bit more precise, so the gamma couples to F. F doesn't necessarily have unit charge in terms of electron charge. So there's some QF here. So there's also going to be some QF here. Okay, where QF is in units of E. So for an electron, QF is just one or minus one. Okay. Now, this simple dark sector can do a lot. And of course, we can dress it up to make it do even more. But what we have now is a new mediator that couples to electric charge. We can look for that. We have a mediator that mediates dark matter interactions. So we can have dark matter self-scattering just in the dark sector. That can give you self-interacting dark matter. You have ways to produce the mediator. So you have ways to produce the dark matter. So for example, in the early universe, I might have an interaction like this, where the dark matter could annihilate the standard model particles, or vice versa. This is how we could set our relic abundance from thermal freeze out. So that's just the same thing as a Z prime model, except now for an A prime. And I've set it up like this. So that's, um, and of course, you can turn this diagram around. You can have dark matter, you can have the dark matter scatter of standard model particles. Um, you can produce it from right to left. You can have standard model particles produce the chi as well. We can introduce some additional dynamics in the dark sector. We can split the masses. So we've got inelastic dark matter chi 1, chi 2. We can see how that changes the phenomenology. <clears throat> Good, I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Okay. So the A prime can be the dark matter if its mass is much less than the electron mass. Um, if its mass is much higher than the electron mass, then it decays too quickly. Okay. But yeah, so that, that's sort of the simple thing, and it does a lot. And that's a good simplified model which we can work with. Yes? So have you given out a small mass to the photon? No, so the, ma the photon is massless. There's no, the, the U1 electromagnetism is unbroken. But you give it an epsilon size contribution? Not to the mass. So because in this basis change, right, there's no, there's no mass that the photon picks up. So I can always choose the basis in such a way that the photon is massless. Okay. Now, in certain bases, I might think there's a mass, but then one has to be careful and you can just, it doesn't actually have a mass. So, yeah. Say that again, sorry. Yeah, so I've neglected higher order things. Yeah, so, I've, so if you do the whole thing, there's some additional terms which I've neglected. You can include those. It doesn't change that question, for example. It doesn't change the question of what, whether the photon gets a mass. Okay. Now, you know, the Z boson, for example, um, so the Higgs, well, I'll mention that a bit later, but you know, if you go to higher masses, then the coupling that I've written down here is not as simple. It doesn't just couple to electromagnetic charge. There's also mixing with the Z. Okay, so for example, the dark photon can decay to neutrinos there's through the Z mixing a little bit because the, mixes origin, the original mixing is with hypercharge, right? It's just that at low energies, the most important consequence of this is this here, okay? So if you want to know more details about, you know, the basis changing, etc., cetera, yeah, so in principle, right, what you have is you've got three neutral gauge bosons. You've got the dark photon, the photon, and the Z boson. And in principle, you can ask what's the mass eigenstate of those three. You can diagonalize the mass matrix. Um, at low energies, that's the most important thing here. But you, there are important effects 
for molecular precision measurements that also constrain parameter space, which uh, you don't quite see in this, the way I've set it up here. But if you want to know more details, then you can look at, um, well, various papers. But you can look at this one, for example. I think this is a paper by, that Leon Tao was on, and this one here. Okay. So we don't set it. Who asked the question? Okay. Yeah, we, we uh, yeah, here I haven't written something down. I can add a mass term for chi. Mm. It could be get it from the Higgs mechanism. So it could get it from the dark Higgs mechanism. There could be some carbon coupling between the chi and the, and the Higgs. Um, yeah, that's a simple way of giving it. But I, I don't really care right now for the for logical applications. But that's one way to do it. That's right. One field. That's right. I don't think there's good motivation. It's the simplest. Um, yeah, it's the simplest. Uh, you, it has to be a U1, right? So what you can imagine is that there is a hidden sector. You can imagine some non-abelian gauge group, right? So you can have fermions, the chi is charged in some non-abelian gauge symmetry, that's some non-abelian dark gauge symmetry. That's totally fine. People have considered that in the past as well. It makes, actually makes the phenomenology very interesting. There's different signals that you want to look for. And maybe I'll mention that briefly this time at some point. But um, otherwise, it's really, this is just simple. What you could imagine that there's some SUN dark cross U1 hypercharge, uh, U1 prime. The U1 prime does the hypercharge mixing. And then you can you know, mix all the SUN and U1 fields, break all the symmetries, et cetera. And then you've got basically a whole bunch of dark gauge bosons that have a small kinetic mixing with, with uh, standard model particles. And that leads to interesting phenomenology. Um, but in this case, to keep it simple, you know, we, we have one field. Um, but certainly, people have considered more complicated things as well. And theoretical motivation, I don't think there's a good one, except simplicity, especially uh, in this venue. Pedagogically, it's easy to start with the simplest. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> now, so as I was saying, this sort of does a lot of stuff already. You know, SIEM, self indexing dark matter. You can get it, get the right radical bonds from thermal freeze out. Just as a sort of as a preview of what I'll do in the last lecture a little bit is that you can calculate what the cross-section is for this process. Of course, it's trivial to calculate this. And you can fix the parameters or certain combinations of parameters if you want to get the right relic abundance. And that then gives you a target that experiments could aim for to probe this particular very simple dark sector. Okay. And that's a lot, of, a lot of work has gone over into that the last few years. And there's some exciting searches that people are planning, some exciting experiments. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. Just very briefly about you know, what, is the, you know, what are the values of epsilon that you might care about? What are the values of the dark photon mass that you might care about? So the epsilon, you know, it's a dimension four operator. Maybe I'll find the right board. Let's see. Oh, it's gone. Anyway, it doesn't matter. OK. So it's a dimension four operator. And it could just be a UV boundary condition. So you can write down this dimension for operator. And it, you know, it's a marginal parameter. So it could be generated some very high scale. It's arbitrary. We don't know what it is. It could be 1 in principle, theoretically. Or it could be super tiny. Um, we can imagine scenarios where the kinetic mixing is absent at some high scale. So for example, if we embed one of the U1s, the hypercharge U1, for example, into a grand unified theory, then we would only generate the kinetic mixing term below that scale. So then we would say, OK, at the gut scale, it's 0. And then below that scale, I could generate it. And the way I could generate it is, for example, through some loop of heavy particles, which 
interact both with hypercharge and with the dark U1. So, so the first answer is that it's arbitrary. <coughs> Let me draw. There's an R missing. Good. Okay. <coughs> so, um, yeah. So it's a, it's a UV. Basically, it's sensitive to physics at some cutoff lambda, whatever that might be, and some UV boundary condition. But you can imagine that it's absent a high scale. So the way to do that, for example, is that you embed the U1 hypercharge into grand unified theory, or even the dark U1 into some grand unified theory. And then it could be generated below that scale. So can we generate at lower scales, lower scales, doesn't have to be very low, through loops. So one, for example, what you could have is the dark photon, some loop of particles with the hypercharge gauge boson, B mu. And these are some particles in that loop. There could be many particles in that loop. And they could be very heavy. And you can just calculate what epsilon could be, what, 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 it, what it is. So there's some G1, that's the hypercharge coupling to these particles. So these particles are charged, of course, under both U1 prime and U1 hypercharge. So G1, G dark, there's a loop. So there's a 16 pi squared. And then you can have a log <clears throat> of some scale, cutoff scale, over M psi. And this G1 is, you know, 0.1-ish, 0.3-ish or so. G dark is whatever you want it to be. Could be, you know, order 1, 0.1 or something like that. 16 pi squared, that's 1 over 100, roughly. The log, uh, we could take it to be order 1 if these scales are similar, um, or we can take it to be much larger. But you can easily get, you know, 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2 from this simple thing. And you can do more complicated things where you embed the U1s into hypercharge. There's some symmetries that, that uh, then force that the simple one loop is finished and uh, it cancels. And then you can have a two loop diagram, for example, and get smaller epsilons. But basically, epsilon is arbitrary, but it certainly is not unreasonable to imagine that it's sort of a loop factor down from one. Okay, so 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3, or even a bit lower than that. Okay, yeah. Uh, with the dark photon model. Yeah, so there's certainly, I mean, not, not any psi would work. So you have to be a bit, you have to do the right thing. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, and similarly for MA prime, you know, the A prime mass, uh, in principle, it's arbitrary what the dark photon mass is. Now, you could imagine that it's set by the weak scale. So whatever sets the weak scale, so if you imagine some SUSY breaking setting the weak scale, then we can imagine that the kinetic mixing parameter between the standard model and the dark sector secludes the dark sector from uh, the, the supersymmetry breaking. And the only mass scale that the dark sector gets is epsilon suppressed compared to the weak scale. So you can imagine some dark sector mass scale that is epsilon times the weak scale if it only feels the SUSY breaking through some kinetic mixing. Um, but again, that depends on the model. But certainly, it's not unreasonable to imagine that a dark sector could be you know, below -ish, lo just below the weak scale in general. So something that's, that's you know, GEV or even MEV or whatever is, is totally reasonable in some models. But you know, more generally speaking, it's an arbitrary thing. Okay. Okay, so what we'll do first now is we'll consider the, 
the super simplest dark sector where we just have the dark photon and we're going to consider various searches for it. And once we have some toolbox built up, then what we can do is we can consider you know, the dark matter in addition to that and look to see how the searches of homology changes once we have a dark sector, the dark matter. And the reason to go through these models, you know, again, like this, 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 simple, this simple model is, is very simple. It's a useful phonological toolbox, if you like, to see what kind of phonology is possible, what things you should be looking for at colliders, at beam dump experiments, and in other experiments. Um, but of course, you know, there's more complicated things are, are possible. But these are the things that people have thought about a lot the last few years, and you should at least be aware of them, I think, uh, because it's become a mature enough field to, you know, that everyone should know a little bit about it, I think. So before, so before we consider the dark matter, let's forget the dark matter, we would make it heavy in the simplified model, then it's not important for the phenomenology. And what we have is just the dark photon. And we can ask, how can we produce it? How does it decay? What do we look for? So, so consider A prime by itself. In order to know what, it, what to look for, we can first discuss the decays. And there's two very distinct regimes. One where the dark photon mass is above the lightest electromagnetically or electrically charged particles, the electron. So above twice the electron mass, so about an MeV. And one where it's below that. And above that, it can, of course, decay to electrons and positrons. Below that, it cannot. And that makes a huge difference to the phenology. In particular, above it, what you have is just a very simple decay to electrons and positrons, or any other standard model fermions that are electrically charged. And the decay rate is given by 1 over 3 alpha epsilon squared MA prime. And then there are some kinematic factors So that's the exact decay rate to electrons and positrons. Of course, in the decay to muons, the expression is exactly the same, except that you would replace with the electron with the muon. And then it can also decay to QQ bar. Now, of course, QQ bar is complicated because there's a strong force, et cetera, that you have to worry about. So what we can do is, in general, we can talk about decays to hadrons. And you know what the decay to hadrons looks like. So if you take electron-positron collisions and you, you're in the standard model, you collide it and you see what comes out. So there can be electron-positrons coming out, mu plus or minus, hadrons, etc. You see resonances. You see the rho omega resonance, the j psi resonance. Those are all famous experiments that were done. And people have measured what the photon would do, uh, how the photon couples to e plus or minus. Well, and, and the other, and hadrons in general. And the dark photon, of course, is just mixing with the photon. So we can just take that information and use it for the hadrons. And the way to do that is that we can write the hadron decay width to be the mu plus or minus decay width times a function that's usually called r. And r is defined to be E plus E minus to hadrons over the cross section for E plus E minus to muons. And that is a measured quantity. And you take this at the center mass energy for this process uh, of, uh, we set the center mass energy equal to MA prime. Okay. Does everyone know what R is, right? Okay. If you don't, you should. But uh, we, that, that's, that's a standard thing. But that's what we can do. So now we can just use data basically to get the whole decay width. And then what the branching ratio looks like is the following.
<coughs> so we have branching ratio as a function of the dark photon mass. Again, we care about the light stuff, so let's focus on the low masses. Let's take it to be above 2 Me. We'll get to the other one in one second. Let's make this one and this a half. So below twice the muon mass, it can only decay to E plus E minus. So the, hundred, the branching ratio to a standard model particles is 100% to E plus E minus. Once you get to the two muon threshold, then the dark photon can decay to muons as well. So then the branching ratio to electrons drops. And let me just finish drawing it like this. This is 0.8 GeV. You'll see why it does that in a second. So here it comes in. This is mu plus or minus. <clears throat> and then around 7, 800 MeV, what happens? Hadrons, yeah. So pi plus or minus and pi plus pi minus pi zero, why? Rho, yeah, and the omega. Okay, so the rho is a big, uh, very wide resonance. So what you get is something like this. So this is pi plus pi minus. This is from the rho. The rho is very wide. Its width, so its mass is 775 MeV. Its width is you know, 150 MeV. And the omega is, sits, is much narrower, but it basically sits in the middle here. And that dominantly decays to pi plus pi minus pi zero. And that's much narrower, so its width is 8 MeV, its mass is 782 MeV. <clears throat> OK, so you've got these decays, E plus E minus, mu plus E minus. Um, mu plus E minus approaches E plus E minus once the mass effect, mass threshold, the mass, the, the, these additional terms that contain the masses once they become negligible. And then you've got the pi plus pi minus pi zero and pi plus pi minus decays. And then, it's easy to calculate what the total decay length is. And it's 0.1 centimeters for a coupling of 10 to minus 5 of the epsilon squared. And uh, 1 GeV over Ma prime. And then I've got a one over N effective. And that N effective, what I mean is I just mean the number of possible decay modes. So it's basically given by uh, these terms there. So sum of uh, leptons, electrons, and tau. So of course, if you go to higher, right, you can also decay to taus, tau plus tau minus. Etc. So in general, this an effective is given by sum of a e to tau. There's a square root. I'm going to be lazy. That square root is just the square root there. And then there's a parenthesis, which is just the same thing with the mass replaced by lepton. And then plus the square root with a muon for a muon times 1 plus r. So in general, that's the number n effective, the way it's defined here. But what you see is that the decay length can be very, very small. So the decay can be prompt if epsilon is larger than you know, 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 2 or so. Um, it can be slightly displaced if you've got a decay, uh, an epsilon of 10 to minus 5-ish, 10 to minus 6 or so, of course, depending on the mass as well. And if epsilon is much smaller than that, then the decay length would be huge, can easily be meters, 100 meters, et cetera. So in order to probe even the super simple dark sector, just the dark photon, you need a whole range of experiments just to look for it. Okay. You need things that are sensitive to prompt decays, to displaced decays, and to long-lived decays. And uh, yeah, so that, that's okay. And then very quickly, yeah, I've got time, one second.
So clearly above an ME, <coughs> to ME, it can't be dark matter because it just decays way too quickly. It can't be long lived. <coughs> but below an ME, below an MEV, it's below twice the electron mass, it can be long lived because the only possible decay mode, well, there's a decay to neutrinos, but that's super tiny. The, the dominant decay mode is into three photons through a loop of charged particles. And the lifetime for this is one second. If you take an epsilon of 0 0.003 over epsilon here, Me over Ma prime, which is the ninth power, Okay, there were some brave people that calculated this actually precisely. So Hari, uh, Ramani, and uh, McDermott and Patel calculated this very precisely. So if you want to know the latest and greatest calculation, it was actually just done very recently. And the effects are important just near the mass threshold. Otherwise, this formula is, is good. So been, been near, uh, close to twice the electron mass. But that's roughly how it scales. And you can see that this is easily long-lived. I can make it easily longer lived than the universe, age of the universe especially if I make the dark photon mass small, okay? And then, again, there's all possible kinds of, all possible kinds of searches that you might want to do for this dark photon. And because it mass, well, you know, log scale, it's, it's, a, it's a very long way down to zero, uh, an infinite way down to zero. So you want to do a whole bunch of different kinds of searches to look for dark photons that could potentially be dark matter. And I think Peter's going to talk about that, some of those searches, okay? Uh, good. But we're not going to focus on this. We're going to focus on the higher mass stuff. OK. And I should stop, right? Who's in charge? Yeah. OK. Hmm? Yeah, OK. So let me stop here. And then we'll quickly do a few of the searches. And then we'll add dark matter and look, see how the search that we'll talk about get changed. And then do direct detection. OK, thanks. <laughs>